Oh, you're very glitchy. Is your internet bad today? Probably. I'm also <laughs> stuttering. Citizens raging against phones? Your organization's called crap? Exactly, Lazo. <laughs> exactly. God, nothing will ever top GTA 3 Chatterbox. I'm sorry. Just won't. But And yet you're calling up on a phone <laughs> to tell the world about it. Welcome to Namely 90s. Wow. The podcast that takes you back to the time before smartphones, Google, and Y2K. Join your hosts as they relive the pop culture that shaped a generation and the parts that many people wish they could forget. Listen in to the conversation about how the decade defined those who spent their childhood there and how it shaped them as adults. So... Turn down the grunge and dial up the internet. Let's get started. It's time for Namely 90s. That's right. You're listening to Namely 90s. My name's Andrew and over there is Brandon. That's me. You can find us online at Namely90s.com or on Twitter and Instagram at Namely 90s with a 90s. You can also find the show on YouTube at YouTube.com slash at Namely 90s. And if you'd like to support the show, head over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash namely 90s, also with 90s, and sign up for one of our support levels. Whew, man, I feel like it's been an extended release vacation. What? (laughs) (laughs) From our podcasting duties over the Uh, course of the last, what, three weeks now? Three weeks, yeah. It's been been a bit, been a bit since we've recorded it. I... Enough I've, time for me to still have the same illness and for you to have contracted it somehow. Yes, from you. Even <laughs> yeah. though we haven't Through seen each other. Through the airwaves. Yeah. I, we were close. We were close uh, to, to meeting up. Uh, just off by a day. A day or so. It's, yeah. it's about a day. Yeah, I was in the old Sacramento again. Oh, and I was in uh, Napa was a for a disc golf tournament. Deluge of uh, moisture coming from the, the, I almost said ceiling, the sky you know the outdoor ceiling um yeah uh i I actually i so the first day of the tournament it sprinkled a little bit for like maybe an hour or so but the second day it was just pouring the whole five hours when disc golf turns into a water sport yeah uh it was i i luckily changed because i had a four and a (laughs) like a four and a half hour drive back so I, i like changed out of my clothes in public uh, uh, to uh, to be dry on my my drive home. You're just riding a jet ski on the on the uh, the disc golf course. I mean, they had us park on like a muddy area. I was yeah. afraid my car wouldn't get get to high ground. ground. Yeah, well, it, I was in a hotel in Sacramento, a god awful mm-hmm. hotel, uh, the Med Park Midtown or something not familiar with Sacramento. I'm I'm going to name it because it's that bad just because people need to know, but it was a choice hotel. It wasn't my choice. Let me just put it that (laughs) way. Um, but there was a continuous water dripping sound like every second and a half in the ceiling, Mm -hmm. which was very distracting. I I had to turn up law and order SVU really loud to drown out the, uh, the, uh, dropping of water sound, but then it was like crime noises. And uh, then when it was raining really hard, it sounded like someone was draining their bathtub above me. I was on the second story <laughs> of three, four. Wow, that's impressive. What, where? What? Uh, well, you know how those uh, how, how those sunny area hotels are built with just the second floor open to to the sky. And, and then they had one of those areas like in the lobby where you can buy, you know, snacks and stuff. Mm-hmm. But it was like it was like an old style can of coke that clearly hadn't been replaced since like 1997 like and like that, one bag of popcorn tab. yeah <laughs> it was like what is this place and like two kinds of laundry detergent you could buy oh because that's what you want to do when you're on a vacation in a hotel your own laundry <laughs> and a woman with i got there about 1 a.m mm-hmm. and a woman with oh, the yeah, longest right. nails i'd ever seen clicked at the computer mm-hmm. for I mean, well, you can't type with those. Not even exaggerating. She clicked for like four and a half minutes was to like check me in. Peck typer? Or no, no, she was clicking. Like clacking. No, she was using the mouse. She's oh. clicking around the screen, typing occasionally. Four and a half minutes. Not like, even I'm exaggerating. The one person that's not checked in yet, ma'am. Yeah, it's like 
it's why are there so many clicks? It's insane. Mm. Well, she was anyway. probably finishing up her game of solitaire, then checking. It out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never thought of that. That's yeah. Good point. Uh, well, you may have noticed that I'm extra zippy today because I just did my first improv class in over a decade and a half. Um, so I am zip zapping and zork being all, Were all of your characters sick. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, no, I like I'm not sick. I, I'm this is me on the mend. Um, but I, it's, all I've had is just like a, a tiny nasal drip. And that's like irritating the back of my throat. So I'm coughing and then yep. been um, there. Yeah. And it's, it's so annoying. And uh, like, you know how like guys get, get uh, crap for being like oh, babies ED? when they're sick. Yes. Erectile <laughs> dysfunction. No, you dysfunction. Know how, so you, you literally <laughs> just said dysfunction. <laughs> I had a problem with enunciating today. Um, but uh, you know, man flu, I think, is the term that that women like to use um, because we like we get just a little bit of sick and then are unable to function. I've never really succumbed to that, but this this thing is killing me. Like, uh, like it's just a little bit of a drip, but it's making me cough, and I, I hate it. And then the cough like hurts my lungs, and um, it. It's, it's, I'm again, I'm on the mend. I, um, I'm better than I was yesterday, which was better than the day before, but it's just, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing. And I'm complaining about it. And I feel like a, a man baby, um, just because I am unable to, uh, fight off a small nasal drip that I've had for a week. <laughs> And well, I, granted, I was in the rain for two days for five hours straight. Um, but, uh, you know, so it's interesting. Um, you mentioned that because I was it reminded me of the whole, you know, like man cold thing because, That's, yeah, there's what actually I was talking about, right? Yeah, there's science to back it up. What that we are useless when we're well, sick. apparently, I mean, I'm not going to go into the the depth of it, but some studies were done and basically like. Apparently, the presence of estrogen reduced viral counts in people's bloodstreams. What? Um, and also that they did a study uh, just looking at statistics and men are more likely to be admitted to the hospital because of the flu. What? Are you looking at Breitbart? Like, <laughs> no, this is this is uh, a medical journal. Yes, this is medical research. There are there are differences uh -huh. biologically between men and women. Oh, um, I've, I've never noticed. I'm, as you know, I'm blind to that. And anatomically. Um, but no, there, there is a basis to suggest that one sex could have worse symptoms than the other. Hmm. And then there was oh, this one part of it yeah. said, <laughs> when, when women were asked if they would um, be interested to hear about, you know, uh, what did it say? They'd be interested to hear about science that backs up why men have man colds. One woman was just like, I don't care. <laughs> Like, okay. I mean, I mean, they they do tend to go through more um, monthly uh, discomfort than we do on a regular. Yeah, basis. I feel like there is an element of that. Like, if you're used to being uncomfortable in some way mm -hmm. frequently, then you're probably going to have a higher threshold for that. Correct. Uh, but uh, one can't be blamed for not having a period. So, to be fair, <laughs> you're just born this way. Right. And also, so, hey, listen, I didn't choose to have worse cold symptoms than others. Just saying. I, I mean, I'm going to wait because of how I, my parents uh, raised me. Yes. <laughs> in, in the South. Yeah. That led to other <laughs> mental problems. Yes, it's the um, your split personality is the one that I fear the most. <laughs> yes 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 if it's, ever, it's my personality that loves banana splits yes and <laughs> and bananas foster he like finds a torch for some reason any chance he gets and will flambe a banana we've now offended many groups of people uh, oh, yes uh for making light of uh what what is the term actually called? Um, Multiple personality disorder, dissociative, no, a, diso, disassociative, disassociative identity disorder. Identity. Yeah, yeah. 
That's we uh, apologize. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, what else? I'm glad this is probably the episode that my new friends at uh, <laughs> my improv uh, class improv. Have, are going to be listening to. It's They're fine. Fantastic. <laughs> This is a study in how not to improvise. <laughs> True. Just say increasingly offensive things. Well, to well be that's fair, what Joe Rogan does. So <laughs> to be fair, like the the re, like the reason why I took it, I've been encouraging you to take one too, uh, is just so that we can we can riff better and um, you know uh, I can take uh, take the ball that you pass and, and all I can do is make that's what that's what she said jokes and rip on Joe Rogan. Those are my only two uh, joke pathways. Uh, you know, that works for me. I can just rip on everyone else. <laughs> oh man. Well, uh, <laughs> sorry. So we are back and uh, let's see From last week. We had a variety show episode. I don't even remember what it was about anymore. Um, do you remember? Uh, the last one that we did, yeah, was last, last week's week. episode or the uh, last, last deep dive. Uh, the variety show was on Star Wars. Yes, that's right. the The great debate, yeah, which yeah. was much better executed than our first. <laughs> You're welcome. Fair enough. Um, but now we are back in the deep dive format as oh, we yes. do switch every week from variety show to deep dive. Correct. And this deep dive done by me it doesn't really fit into a particular uh what do they say um seo algorithm for <laughs> this point in time right yeah i mean unless there's a surprise er reboot in the next five days i doubt it you know or a michael Crichton thing coming out i mean er is a pretty searched term because there's e's and r's and a lot of words next to each other oh yeah yeah that's it yes you're correct the other thing is that the seo really does suck for trying to find the show er it does it's one of the, it's a nightmare you really can't uh anyway so it's it's as you know one of my favorite shows my favorite medical show of all time correct um followed as a you know, close second by house which is spectacularly inaccurate from a medical standpoint well mm. somewhat like it's researched, but the actual day to day, like medical things that they do are pretty it's stupid. Lupus. Yeah. Like when someone is having a cardiac arrest, they never once do any like CPR. They just keep shocking the person, even though they don't have a shockable rhythm. And then they're like, <laughs> they're not living. And it's like, you're not doing the right thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> not to mention the doctors do all their own tests, which in real life, like, they wouldn't even lift a finger. They would just make some random tech do it and then go have coffee. Yeah, that's why they have labs. Yeah, exactly. They just have a bunch of Labradors running around. No. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> for those of you that somehow don't know, or I guess were born later, uh, ER is an American medical drama television series that aired from 1994 to 2009 with a total of a whopping 331 episodes spanning 15 seasons. Actually, it was supposed to end after season 14, but uh, because of the unexpected writer's strike, they did not have adequate time to do a proper sending off, if you will, mm-hmm. of the show. So NBC approved a 15th and final season. With John Stamos. With John Stamos, Angela Bassett, and several other people. <laughs> but every character from the original pilot returned during that final season in some form or fashion, which is kind of cool. Cool. And especially when you realize how many of those characters died. Well, the one high profile dead character, there was a flashback to Angela Bassett's character back when she knew him as a doctor. Mm. So that's how they got away with it. And then there was a flashback to John Stamos and full house. <laughs> there was. Anyway, um, to fun. learn about the origins of ER, we must fir- first learn about American author and filmmaker, Michael Crichton. So, I mean, it's a name that many people, most people should know. You may know him from such books and films as, wow, I just thought of, I I was going to say that like, um, who is it? Who is that played by in the Simpsons? Because like, you uh, may remember me from yeah, such Phil Hartman. His character yeah. is I'm Troy McClure. Yeah, Troy McClure. You, you may, may remember, remember me. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You may remember me from such films as My yeah, so, Date with the Teenage Daughter. 
So anyway, you may know him from such books and films as The Andromeda Strain, Jurassic Park, The Lost World, Airframe, Timeline, Sphere, Congo, and Westworld, etc., etc., etc. His books have sold... Timeline, Sphere. No, Timeline and Sphere are a separate nah. thing. Paul Walker's in Timeline. I think Dustin Hoffman's in Sphere. Hmm. And Samuel L. Jackson? I don't know. Anyway, his books have sold over 200 million copies worldwide, which is... I think astonishing. I actually don't know what really prolific authors do for sales numbers, but I don't think I've ever done two million, 200 million of anything. That's fair. Um, so anyway, uh, John Michael Crichton was born on October 23rd, 1942 in Chicago to parents, John and Zula. Uh, he graduated from Harvard in 1964 and after which he enrolled in the Harvard medical school. He began writing in 1995 while attending Harvard medical school and interestingly, uh, chose to write under a pen name, John Lang to avoid this concern from his patients that he might use them for his plots, which he absolutely did. Uh, but just not by their names. Um, he also at one time went by Jeffrey Hudson and Michael Douglas. Interestingly enough, Michael Douglas as in, yeah, huh. I mean, I don't think Michael Douglas was famous yet. Right. So, um, anyway, but, uh, I guess they are releasing like eight of his books that he wrote as John Lang. They're like re-releasing them soon. Uh, and, uh, that's kind of exciting. Like I'll probably read those. I've never read them before. So, you know, cool. Cool. Deal. Yeah. Uh, so the first book he published under his real name was 1969's, uh, little known the Andromeda strain, which is actually one <laughs> of the best known books out there. Uh, and especially when it comes, it's like a techno thriller about emerging infectious diseases. I think it might be alien as well. Uh, I think there was a movie of that too, but it was probably unwatchable because it's from the seventies. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he graduated from Harvard medical school in 1969, but never practiced medicine. Well, he instead 2008 miniseries focused on writing. Wouldn't it be nice to just like be so, so white and privileged that you go to med school and then just write instead. Yes. <laughs> to yeah, pay off your medical school. Like bills. I'm white enough. I'm not privileged enough, but nor yes. smart enough. So, um, but anyway, in 1974, he wrote a screenplay, which was originally intended to be a movie based on his own experiences as a medical student in a busy hospital emergency room. But, uh, the TV studios were not interested, you know, it's the seventies. It was a different time. I don't know how or why, but they weren't <laughs> interested. I mean, they can be interested in one thing one day and not the next and vice versa. It just depends on who you talk to and whether you're going to get a break or anything. But uh, <clears throat> after publishing uh, Jurassic Park in 1990, he began to work with Steven Spielberg on the film adaptation of that book. Um, after that occurred, they also decided to film the ER screenplay as a two hour pilot for a television series rather than a feature film. The pilot episode of ER is titled 24 hours and aired on September 19th, 1994. Um, let's see what else. This is interesting. So the script remained almost entirely unchanged since 1974, except Crichton realized that, well, the entire book is about only white men. <laughs> so they recast uh, Dr. Lew Lewis. Now Susan Lewis is a woman. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Peter Benton, Benton as an African-American. So they had to diversify that cast. It was the 90s after all. Yes. So you have the one standard female and one standard black. Yep. And the rest number. white. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> white males. All, all of them. Uh, so anyway, um, the pilot was shot at the former Linda Vista Hospital in Los Angeles which is a common set for multiple things. It's no, it's thought to be haunted, which is creepy. Um, but they kind of put it right, brought it back to life as a, uh, functioning hospital set anyway. Mm. And then once the series was actually ordered, they built a set resembling the Los Angeles County ER or dupl a replica of it. So, mm. uh, now, you know, uh, anyway, so with Spielberg now attached to the series, NBC decided to order six episodes. Uh, it, uh, it premiered 
basically opposite of a Monday night football game, but it was on NBC instead of ABC where the football game was, obviously. Right. And then after that, they moved it to Thursdays and it just absolutely took off. Um, and it's noted that the success of ER surprised the networks and critics alike. And it really was expected to be completely crushed by Chicago hope, <laughs> which was like a similar type of show right. that was on the air at the time by David E. Kelly. His, his name is linked as if he's someone famous. He must be famous. He must have done a lot of good TV or something. But uh, uh, Chicago Hope. Well, I remember um, David. Oh, Doogie Hauser. Chicago Hope turned into Chicago uh, Nope. Also, if you know what I mean. David E. Kelly is known for Doogie Hauser, Chicago Hope, The Practice, Boston Legal, Ali McBeal, and... I think that's about it. I just wanted to make the Chicago Nope joke. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, So anyway, uh, kind of some interesting little facts here. Uh, Crichton remained an executive producer uh, until his death in 2008, but was credited as an executive producer for the remainder of the series, which is Mm -hmm. cool. Um, Let's see. John Wells was the executive producer and showrunner for the first three seasons. Um, Wells did some other things like Trinity, which I feel like sounds familiar. Um, but then also third watch in the West wing. So some pretty, pretty cool credits there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely a very skilled team, but for me, I just, I felt like it was important to go through the cast here, which could take a while. Um, I promise you, I don't have a list of credits for each of them. I'm just going to start reading names at a certain point. Okay. And then you can say if any of them mean anything to you. Okay. Uh, Anthony Edwards. Was he in stuff? Um, no. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> he was Goose in, okay, Goose uh, in Top, uh, Top Gun. Um, he was also in Wild Wild West. Revenge of the Nerds. Oh, yeah. That's right. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, George Clooney. And I just wrote in parentheses. Who? <laughs> right. He was uh, like Rachel's. Uh, I think he like was a doctor and yeah, he did. They did a crossover with friends once. Um, strangely enough, George Clooney was in a show called E slash R for eight episodes in 1984 and 1985. Interesting. I didn't know. He was also in the facts of life and apparently Roseanne. Hmm. And also he was a Batman with the the bat nipples. Oh, I should be saying Anthony Edwards played, uh, uh, Mark green. Yes. Dr. Mark Green, George Clooney played uh, Dr. Doug Ross, and oh, then brother, where art thou? Sherry Stringfield played um, Dr. Susan Lewis. She was in Guiding Light and NYPD Blue. And to be clear, these are credits before the series. Obviously, oh. there were a lot of other stuff. Gotcha. Um, Noah, I think it's Wiley. I'm just going to say Wiley for the remainder of this episode. Noah Wiley played John Carter. Uh, a few good men. By the way, John Carter was basically um, Michael Crichton. Like he was writing that character as himself. Interesting. Didn't know that. <clears throat> and then uh, let's see. Carol Hathaway nurse played by Juliana Margulies was in one episode of law and order and one episode of murder. She wrote quite the credit. But uh, like, you know her name because of because she's famous now. Right. Uh, she was in what the good wife and some other stuff. I, I think she is the good wife. She is. Yeah. Uh, and then Eric LaSalle plays Dr. Peter Benton. He was Dr. Peter Benton. Sorry. He was in one life to live or one life to life. If you read my notes coming to America, you didn't which, send me your notes. LA law and quantum leap. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't. And quantum leap. And then we'll start reading names. Uh, let's see. Gloria Rubin, Laura Ines, Maria Bello, Alex Kingston, Alex Kingston, uh, British actress. Yes. Um, she plays Do- Dr. River song and Dr. Who. She also plays um, Elizabeth Corday in this show. Mm-hmm. Doctor. She's a surgeon. Uh, um, Kelly Martin, Paul McCrane, Goran Viznik, uh, Michael Michelle, Eric Palladino, Maura Tierney, Ming Na Wen, which, so interestingly, she first debuted mid season one. Mm. Made a little bit of a medical mistake. She wasn't supposed to be doing disappeared, returned as a regular in mid season six because of her popularity from Mulan. Probably. And she remained on the show for a number of years. Mm. Uh, Sharif Atkins 
Uh, this is spelled wrong. It's supposed to be Mackay Pfeiffer. It says Mackay Figur. Pfeiffer. <laughs> Mackay Pfeiffer. He sounds uh, familiar. Parmander and Nagra. Linda Cardellini. Shane Linda West. Linda Cardellini. I'm going to stop you. Linda Cardellini oh, yeah. is known for... Um, Being in Scooby-Doo. I was going to say Freaks and Geeks. But yeah, she was <laughs> Velma in the live-action Scooby-Doo's. And she's Hawkeye's wife in the Avengers MCU universe. Uh, there you go. Mm-hmm. Um, Shane West, Scott Grimes. Oh, Shane West. He's um, he's from something. He has a goatee, I think. Um, yes. Scott Grimes, who was in Band of Brothers, actually. It's funny because he's kind of a not very serious character. Uh, John Stamos, David Lyons, and Angela Bassett. Now, these are the official series regulars like mm-hmm. that appeared in the title card. Yeah. And a big shout out to James Newton Howard who created the iconic theme song and score for just the pilot. But uh, I feel like James Newton Howard had a lot of credits to, uh, to his name, which is just like, bum, 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 like over and over yeah. again. It's good. It's I can good. Hear it in my head. Yeah. Uh, anyway, before I give you a very int- well, sorry, what were you going to say? Uh, I was, nothing but i can make the joke john uh, i was gonna say whatever happened to predictability the news and the paper boy is it something everywhere you look <laughs> every every smile you take i'm trying to wow. do the full house theme song i couldn't remember what it was yeah i don't i don't know the theme song at all everywhere everything you, you do there's a, there's a, there's a, we're gonna get copyright strike on, on that too yeah a little in youtube yeah uh anyway well before we get into some of the interesting casting information let's go to brandon for the namely 90s minute Welcome back to our mid-episode break, Namely 90s Minute. Every week we look back at a culturally relevant show, movie, or piece of pop culture that probably helps stoke the algorithm. This week, in honor of Creed 3 hitting theaters, we're looking at the only Rocky movie from the 90s, Rocky V. Rocky V is a 1990s sports drama directed by the original film's director and written and starring Rambo. Also, Connie Corleone from the Godfather trilogy is Adrian, his wife. Did you know she was a Coppola? Nepotism is cool. After the events of Rocky IV, that's the one where he defeats Ivan Drago in communism or something, Rocky is having complications, and after turning down another prize fight, he learns that he has some sort of brain injury. It is also around this time that he learns he's broke because his manager Polly, the guy who made the robot his wife in the last movie, signed the power of attorney over to their accountant, who then spent all the money on bad real estate investments and also didn't pay any of Rocky's taxes over the last four movies. Rocky retires, sells his stuff and mansion, and moves back to the old neighborhood and tries to fix up his old trainer's gym, Mighty Mix Gym. Rocky gets invested in training a young kid named Tommy Gunn, but ends up neglecting his own son, Robert Jr., who then ends up falling in with the wrong crowd after being bullied at school. After blowing off Rocky, Tommy ends up beating the current world boxing champion that Rocky had declined to fight earlier in the movie, but Tommy gets crap for only beating the guy who had never beaten Rocky, the previous world boxing champion, and for leaving Rocky behind the way he did. So, Tommy is convinced he needs to beat Rocky. Meanwhile, Rocky has the usual arc of neglecting his family, finding his worth in boxing, then realizing his family was his strength all along. Tommy ends up punching Polly, so Rocky gets into a back alley brawl with him that ends up getting televised and uses his street fighting skills to beat him. The movie ends with Rocky and Rocky Jr. doing the Rocky steps at the Philadelphia Museum of Art as father and son. And that's Rocky V in a namely 90s minute. More or less. And now back to the show. Uh, So, yeah, I always think it's interesting with these shows to kind of look at how the casting took place Um, because, you know, you always like think about, well, this is who I imagine in this role. And then sometimes there's other people, but I think the stories are sometimes interesting. So Mm -hmm. I pulled some quotes from a, an article in the Hollywood reporter, an interview with John Levy, the casting director for ER Hmm. and regarding Noah Wiley, um, I'm going to read a little quote here. It said, I brought him into a producer. <clears throat> I brought him into a producer session, and funny enough, it was the one producer session that Dr. Crichton attended, and Noah did a fantastic thing. There was a dialogue scene, which he read, of course, but there was also another scene where the young Dr. Carter screws up taking blood from a patient, and it was physical comedy. Noah tied off my bicep with some kind of a wrap, and then using a pencil, he pretended to draw blood from me. Crichton was laughing his head off. It was a brave and exciting addition, and the rest was history. Uh, and interestingly, Raphael Sparge was in the running for John Carter. Do you know who that guy is? No. 
You'll look him up and you'll know who he is and go. Raphael Sparge. S B A R G E. He used in Once Upon a Time. Um, he looks familiar. Yeah, but I don't know what he's in. I can't figure out who he is. Uh, well, he because he looks like the um the guy from Modern Family, but it's not. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting, right? That he's a person we don't recognize. <laughs> oh, he's Jiminy Cricket in Once Upon a Time. Okay, then he could have been John Carter. I'm not sure I would have felt about that. <laughs> uh, I don't think it would have gone well. And then regarding Anthony Edwards, uh, this is a good one. Anthony was a certain kind of young leading man in Top Gun as Goose. And then wasn't he not? He wasn't a leading man. Wasn't he like a second person? I mean, he, yes, he was the second person, okay. but I, I think he's second build. Uh, and then he was a wholly different looking guy by the time he was submitted for ER. John Wells walked over to the pile and picked up the picture and said, oh, that's a good idea. Get him in the first day. And we did. And he ended up casting him. I remember distinctly after we saw the cut of the pilot, legendary Warner Brothers casting director, Barbara Miller, jokingly hollering to her assistant, get my doctor, fire him. I'm going to hire Dr. Green from now. <laughs> That's pretty good. Okay. Uh, he was more believable than a real doctor. Uh, I mean, he, he does, he does have like, you mentioned Revenge of the Nerds earlier, which I forgot he was in and uh, spot on though. Um, like, Ooh. He has these terrible like wire rim round glasses. Mm-hmm. He's bald. Like he just doesn't look anything. I mean, he lost that hair fast, dude. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I guess he was fourth build after Kelly McGinnis and Val Kilmer. What was that? When did uh... oh, speaking of Val Kilmer, I just rewatched Deja Vu and I always forget Val Kilmer's in that movie. Deja Vu. I don't even remember. Denzel that Washington. Um... Oh, it's a time traveling one. Yeah. On that's sweet. I love that movie. It was a fun romp. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's that's all Anthony Edwards. But yeah, definitely a favorite character of mine. I'm not doing everybody, by the way. I have two more. Um, then George Clooney. Apparently, George Clooney was begging for an audition on this show, by the way, which I find hmm. interesting. But he wasn't like super famous back then. Um, this is not quoted from Levy. This is a quote from the article. It said, the handsome Clooney wasn't yet a movie star. I editorialized and added handsome in there. Uh, but he was certainly ready for the spotlight. He had a development deal at Warner Brothers TV at the time, and every casting director wanted him for their project, comedy or drama. The Warner Brothers brass wanted him for a cop show that was in production at the time, but ER won out. Could you imagine? Detective Doug Ross? Wait. Yes. <laughs> a different show. <coughs> Why is Julia Roberts in all of his movies? Uh, well, most of his movies are Ocean's movies, so... True. I they're saw just, there's the I was on the plane character. and I was like over the shoulder silent watching Ticket to Paradise. Was that the new one? Which is that new one? Yeah. It's the worst. Like the writing is so trite. Like it's just as a movie that's been made a hundred times. It just yeah. has George Clooney in it. And Julia Roberts being yeah. a divorced couple. I, I wonder think, what happens at the end. I assume they get back together. Hmm. Um and then Juliana Margulies. Uh this one I thought was interesting. Uh, as important as the relationship between Noah Wiley and Eric LaSalle's character was what developed in the pilot between George and Juliana was the heart of the show, the romance of the show and the great tradition of NYPD blue, someone who was supposed to die in the pilot tested so well that they had to make a miraculous recovery. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Carol Hathaway was supposed to die in the first episode, right? She took a few too many pills on purpose. Um, and then that would have then then we wouldn't even know the name Juliana Margulies, right? Because then her career was actually quite good after this. So mm-hmm. um, this is fun. So moving on into this show had <coughs> the most high profile guest stars from what I can tell from multiple websites of any show on primetime television. I mean, but it was prior to them being high profile. Uh, well, let's let's go through the list. Okay, uh, Ed Asner. Uh, so uh, these are the notable guest well, stars. Well, in the X Files episode that we watched. Sure, uh, and I don't know all these people, but I know most of them. Ed Asner, mm. 2003. Kat Dennings, 2006. Who is that? She's the two broke girls. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The the one that I would assume you would be annoyed by. Oh uh, yeah. She's also no, she's in, all right. She's in Thor. I like her actually. I find her funny actually. Yeah. 
Uh, and this, who was a victim of parental battering. Uh, Kirsten Dunst, who had a six series arc as a sex worker, six episode arc. Yeah. You said series six episode arc. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, Zach Efron was shot. Lucy Liu was the mother of a young child dying of AIDS in mm-hmm. 1995. Chris Pine, 2003 played a drunk teen patient. Susan Sarandon, 2009, a grandmother That's being funny. asked to give consent for donation of her grandchild's organs. Eric Stone Street in 2000 oh. as a man who tried to make his ears look Vulcan, which is a perfect role for him. And Ava Mendez, a babysitter concerned with the well-being of a girl she's caring for. Guest stars whose performances won Emmys. Sally Field, 2001, as Abby Lockhart's mother. Most annoying performance I've ever seen her in, but it's because she's supposed to be bipolar. So now I feel bad for not liking that because it's a mental illness, but it was a horrible, horrible storyline. Um, and then Ray Liotta in 2005 as Charlie Metcalf, a regret ridden dying alcoholic patient. Rip to the max. Rip to the max. Um, and then guest stars who, perf- whose performances earned Emmy nominations include Rosemary Clooney in 1995, an Alzheimer's patient. Well, William H. Macy is not fair. She's his great aunt. <laughs> William H. Macy in 97 as Dr. David Morgenstern. Ewan McGregor in 1997 as Duncan Stewart, a convenience store gunman. I didn't, I always forget he was in this. Who? Ewan McGregor. Oh yeah. You were going to say something about William H. Macy. I'm sorry. No, I mean his, I, I, re, I just, I remember seeing his, um, either commercials for his episodes or some of his episodes and remember seeing like, yeah, yeah. Good actor. He's in the pilot. That would be why he, he was definitely a recurring character. I'm just really holding back saying as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster for Ray, Ray, Ray Liotta. Yeah. Rip to the max. Um, Alan Alda in 2000. Well, and, that was a weird choice. Why is that? Just because, you know, uh, mash. Well, he played an Alzheimer's stricken doctor and one time teacher of Dr. Carrie Weaver. Mm-hmm. Uh, James Cromwell, 2001, as a bishop who was, uh, of course, dying from uh, lupus. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, Passing it's never lupus, except in ER when it sometimes is lupus. Mm-hmm. Uh, Don Cheadle in 2003, a medical student with Parkinson's disease. Uh, Bob Newhart in 2004, an architecture model maker who was losing his sight. Uh, Red Buttons, who is a person. Um, do you know who that is? No. Okay. But I would laugh because you made that be a I, thing. You know, I'd like to hit a red button right now to make you stop talking. Yes. Um, James Woods, 2006, a patient with ALS and former teacher of many of the ER doctors. That's a well that doesn't run dry, apparently. Uh, Forrest Whitaker in 2007, a patient filing a lawsuit against one of the doctors. Stanley Tucci in 2008 before he found Italy uh, and Ernest Borgnine in 2009's Paul Manning. Oh, uh, Red Buttons was like a 60s movie star. Okay. 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s. <laughs> um, <laughs> and now because I've gone too fast, here's random trivia about a year. I think you're fine. Uh, as I stated, it was, it is one of the most Emmy nominated shows in television history earning a total of 124 Emmy nominations with 22 wins, including outstanding, uh, outstanding drama series. I'm so sorry. Uh, multiple cast Emmys as well. Um, but finally in 2008 game of Thrones, uh, dethroned ER is the most nominated with 164 nominations. Wow. And there's still a Starbucks cup. Did yeah. ER still have the, um, did did ER have as many um, visual effects? I doubt uh, it. Yeah. Um, but ER did do a live episode that they did twice, once for the East Coast, once for the West Coast. Mm-hmm. And right. there was only one mistake in one of the episodes where one of the, the guy who was threatening the staff with a syringe dropped it the first time and had to pick it back <laughs> up. But that's a really cool thing. I, I can't believe they did that. I can. Uh, NBC did a whole bunch of those. I know. Um, it's just for that kind of level of show, though. Like, this was a show known for like seven minute panning, like panoramic shots that were continuous. True. 
and they had to memorize all the lingo and like all the procedures. It was nuts. I don't think that episode was quite as heavy in those shots though. If you, you know, they had to set it up correctly uh, to do it. But um, so as you know, uh, Noah Wiley and George Clooney did appear in friends, but not as themselves, but Um, like kind of like themselves, but they did premiere friends and ER premiered in the same season. Mm. Um, There were actually several subtle friends, Easter eggs buried in ER, which I didn't realize. Um, Well, I didn't know. Well, David Schwimmer plays a doctor in the season three premiere. You never see his face, but it's his voice. Interesting. Um, And then Dr. Green's daughter is named. Rachel. Rachel. (laughs) 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 Yeah. Right. And lastly, the feel good moment of the day of the episode. Mm. The show saved lives. Did it. A 28, a 28 year old Texas woman discovered she had a brain tumor because her tongue went out to the side, just like Dr. Green's tongue did when he had a brain tumor. So yeah, he just pushed his tongue out in the, in the, in the mirror. And went uh, to the, side. Uh, the woman's tumor was caught early and she survived. A USC study found that subjects were 65% more likely to change their eating habits. If they watched the episode about obesity, and a 2002 study by the Kaiser Family Foundation discovered viewers increased their knowledge of HPV and contraception after viewing episodes of the show. So you're saying the South would not like watching ER? No, they they would like to. No, no I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Something about venereal diseases. <laughs> you call them that anymore? Can I say mm, that? I don't think so. I think they're STIs. Which is a type of fast Subaru, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> in case you're wondering <laughs> dude I just really want an STI right now what that's unfortunate yeah. for Subaru so there you go that was a rush job through the ER I could have talked more slowly but uh, I think you're fine we actually didn't go too far o- well you didn't go over of course we didn't Yay! Uh, did you ever watch ER I guess you watched one episode <laughs> Yes, I've watched Christmas at least special. one episode front to back. Um, I, I, you know, I can never get into it because I always, I would always like, well, one, it was on too late for me to watch when we were True. kids. 10 o'clock. Thursdays, 10 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. I would have to go to bed much earlier than that. Um, two it, medical dramas just, they bore me. It's and not your I, interest. Yeah. This is, I mean, this is a great series. Like it shot well, it, it's it developed well. Um, I would rather watch this over say Grey's Anatomy, Ugh, yeah. but, um, I like even, even house, which has the humor to it too. I, it's not, it's not my thing. I'm, yeah. I, and of course it's my thing because I'm in the medical side of things. So I find it interesting. Yeah. But if you're in the medical side of things, you don't like watching anything with animals in it. No, but this I don't know enough about human medicine to be annoyed by it. And it is the most accurate medical show ever to be made. Gotcha. No, I don't think anyone will dispute that. It was not perfect by any means because you had to condense things down. Like, you know, you had to take some liberties there, but um, I once watched the entire series during a semester of, I'm sorry, a quarter of college. Yeah, I remember that. Which equates to 10.3 days of television. Excluding ads. I think just to show you up, I watched the entirety of Star Trek Ooh, from boy. TOS through Enterprise, um, which is. I somehow um, had my best quarter yet, though. I don't understand how that was possible. And I left I, college. I aced everything. What's wrong? Well, I guess that was it. Maybe if I had watched uh, two, two times through, I would have, uh, you know, failed college. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There was something else. No, that might be it. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, are you sure? Um. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a great show. It is a great show. I'm not sure it'll ever be matched again. Although people keep trying to make Chicago medical dramas, mm-hmm. and they're shot in that weird, like ultra Blu-ray, 4K UHD. 
method that makes them look fake. But I guess when you said it in Chicago, there's just no hope for them. And that's <laughs> oh. it for this week's episode. Uh, deep dive edition of Namely 90s. Remember, you can find new episodes out every Monday. Join us next week for a variety show episode. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Namely 90s with 90s or find our personal accounts at Bishwitty and at Namely Andrew and tell us what you want us to talk about on future deep dive episodes. If you'd like to support the show, please check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash namely 90s, also with a 90s. And finally, you can also contact us through our website, namely90s.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Audible, Clooney, Teaser, TuneIn, iHeart, Good Pods, and wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Brandon. That's Andrew, and we will catch you next time. Ming-Na Wen's character name was Jingmei Chen. That sounds kind of offensive. (laughs) I'm sure she chose it, but still. I hope she chose it.